One of the things we've been so pleased about with the work on data institutions, all the different fields and parts of the world that the idea has permeated into, and um, not all of which we may have expected when we set out on, on, on this concept a couple of years ago. And that's why I'm so excited about our second keynote speaker, Dr. Nick Pineson. Nick, Nick's the curator of fossil marine mammals at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of National History in Washington, DC. And Nick's work has taken him to all parts of the globe and his scientific discoveries have appeared in the New York Times, the National Geographic, The Economist and the BBC. Nick's also a National Geographic explorer and has recently received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Enge Engineers from the Obama White House. In his book, Spying on Whales, Nick recounts his experiences from the front lines of science to uncover the secret lives of whales from their four-legged past to their perilous present. And on top of that, and perhaps most importantly for today, he totally gets data stewardship and how it can help solve some of the world's biggest problems. Over to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Jack. I'm gonna, let's see, my slides are shared, that's great. Um, I'm so happy to be talking to you from Washington, DC here uh, in my office at the Smithsonian. Um, I work at the National Museum of Natural History and the argument I wanna make today is that natural history museums are data institutions and I wanna, share two parts to that. The first part is story from my own work and then a vision of where it could go. And uh, so data and the whale, uh, first I'm gonna talk about whales and then I'll talk about data. And I think these two ideas are connected because they relate to the value of natural history museums for addressing the crises of our time, which include the big overarching crises of climate change and biodiversity loss but also interlocking social ones, including improving science literacy and um, making sure that the, the resources we build uh, for the long term are available for future generations to use. I, the last slide had a, featured a, a humpback whale in the background, and humpback whales are a good way to frame this talk because their song have been encoded on these golden disks. And these golden disks may be familiar to some viewers. Uh, they are the golden disks that were fixed to the side of the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 space probes. Uh, these probes are now in interstellar space. They're millions of miles away from our planet. Uh, and on board, they carry whale song as part of a package of information, data, um, that tell whomever or whatever may encounter them, a bit about the people who made those probes. And that includes human greetings, includes music, images, and also whale song. And this was all put together at a time when um, the idea that whales could sing was new uh, and it just emerged in public consciousness in the early 1970s. And with it, a sea change in how we understand our relationship to whales. Um, it says a lot that we would encode their song into these golden discs that we put on the side of space probes, but there's a lot more to that than just uh, interstellar space. I want to talk a bit about what we know about whales, because for as much as we think we know about humpback whales, some of the more common and um, uh, a whale species that has actually recovered from the threat of extinction, there's still so much we don't know. And that's really a question that puts us on the front lines of science. And what I'm really, um, something, a source of joy as a scientist is the fact that uh, while there is still so much we don't know about whales, we are living in the golden age of whale science. And I think about images like this one, which were collected from a probe, uh, a drone flown above these two humpback whales as one of them makes a circle, a semicircle of bubbles uh, that form a net to trap their prey, in this case, whales. So whales are able to literally fish in a barrel um, by creating a tool, a bubble net, um, that they're able to improvise. And this information is exchanged uh, across individuals through time. Uh, it's a form of whale culture. And the data that you can get from an overhead drone is spectacular. Uh, it can be quantified relative to the size of the whale. Um, and you're also these days able to put suction cup probes on the backs of whales. And this is all a way to understand, it's from these technological innovations that we have a way of understanding what whales are doing the 99% of the time. They're not at the ocean surface, in this case, looking at the 
onlookers looking at them. Um, we have so many questions about their behavior, their, their ecology, and their evolution. And that's that's where, where uh, my work comes in. I'm more interested in really understanding how they got to this point and where they're going in a future on a planet that is experiencing massive change. Uh, to understand what will happen to whales on planet Earth in the age of the humans requires a bit of understanding what just happened over the last 50 million years of their evolutionary history. Uh, and so that work requires going out into the field and collecting that history in the form of the fossil record. Uh, fossil whale skeletons are sometimes very incomplete or sometimes very complete in this case. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of a side story about how I got into digitizing fossil whales uh, with colleagues in South America. We happened to be at the right place in the right time to find a fossil whale graveyard right along the highway, uh, uh, the Pan American Highway in the Atacama Desert uh, in this remote part of Chile over 40 skeletons of fossil whales were uncovered in a very short period of time. Uh, being right next to the highway, it was part of a highway improvement plan, which led to the expansion of those lanes of highway. The whale skeletons had to be removed, uh, and we didn't have much time to come up with a way to capture the information. You want to be able to answer the scientific question of why those whales are there. And um, that challenge led us to adopting technology that was fairly new at the time um, over uh, just about a decade ago. Um, this is about 10 years ago that we were undertaking this work. Dozens and dozens of complete fossil whale skeletons. And just keep an eye on that whale skeleton in the foreground for a moment, if you would. Um, that whale skeleton is in the next frame, uh, not more than two weeks later. Uh, we were able to bring those same technological tools that um, led to innovations in, in understanding living whales to study the fossil whale ones as well. And uh, capturing that digital record of these skeletons turned out to be the right answer at the time to be able to address the question of why are all these whale skeletons by the side of the highway? Um, ultimately, the answer we think has to do with harmful algal blooms. These um, large whales about six to se or seven to nine million years ago perished uh, after being poisoned by uh, microscopic organisms that create toxins in their environment. And um, those toxins get concentrated up food webs, whales feeding at the top of food webs uh, were most susceptible to these poisons. And we think that this poisoned these dozens and dozens of whales um, repeatedly at this place in the Atacama Desert. So um, to accomplish that, that took a lot of innovation in itself, adopting new technology that wasn't really um, as widespread as it is today. And so today we all have uh, digital devices that are able to capture this kind of information. Um, but at the time, this was new, and it, it was um, a little bit tricky logistically and required thinking broadly. But but the result is a digital data set that captures a moment in time, one that we can use back in a museum setting, back in the lab. And um, for a moment, I, so this is an example of that same skeleton viewed orthographically in a digital environment. This is a high-resolution digital model. And I'm going to step out of this presentation and share a screen if you have a phone and can snap that QR code, that's fine. I'm also going to share a tab with you where you can go to a website to view that same skeleton. And um, what's amazing about this is I'm going to rotate it slowly. These data are viewable through the Smithsonian's Voyager interface. And um, we can manipulate these data. We can um, look at them in higher resolution up close. There are scale bars. and um, What's great is this allows us to not just study the data and to capture information that we might have not have might not have otherwise seen in the moment. We can actually take measurements. Um, the scale bar, for instance, should be 30 centimeters, uh, 30.78. Not bad for just clicking through on this uh, image. So I'll make sure to share that uh, that link uh, both on social media and perhaps through the the Streamyard uh, interface. Um, but this really changed my view of, of how we're able to um, to use digital data about, in this case, the fossil record, but also increase the visibility and usefulness of that information over the long term. And I think that's one of the key responsibilities that's emerging from museums in the 21st century. So now, having shared a, bit, a little bit about the whales, I'm getting more into the data 
And um, at natural history museums, of course, if you were to walk off uh, the National Mall here in Washington, DC, you could walk right into the Sant Ocean Hall and see exhibits of mounted skeletons. Uh, now, um, um, these skeletons are much older than the ones from uh, the whale graveyard in Chile. These, the skeleton before you is an earlier whale from about 40 million years ago, still retaining a lot of uh, the key features from whales' ancestry on land. If you look all the way at the bottom left corner of the slide, you can see little tiny hind limbs. Whales once walked on land, and that, that part of their terrestrial ancestry is a feature that makes them so interesting to study. People come to museums to see the real thing. And I think that really frames historically how natural history, sorry, <clears throat> natural history museums have perceived themselves as stewards of collections. But the reality is that collections are a form of science infrastructure. And what I really wanna argue in the rest of the talk is that we can shift from and, and not neglect the collection stewardship, but we can adopt a new framework, which is one of data stewardship, because what really makes all these objects meaningful um, are the data that they represent, the capture of its context in time, in space, and collecting origins. So collections are a form of science infrastructure. And imagine if for a moment, if we could sort of capture all of the world's natural history collections, at the Smithsonian, we house nearly 150 million specimens that form the bulk of the largest museum collection on the planet. Uh, the next largest museum is Natural History Museum in London, which houses over 60 million objects. And you can imagine starting to add up all those natural history museums, pretty quickly you come to an aggregate number that represents the sum total of the world's knowledge of the natural world, and actually even by extension, our cultural planet, and also the history of the solar system in the universe. So what does this look like? Well, here's one effort to start to talk about these data as a one world collection. Globally, if we take as much of the, as much of the information from institutions that have these data accessible, we're looking at over a billion specimens in collectively in the world's natural history collections. Now, one of the challenges about these data is that we know that they are fundamentally dark. We may have records of them, but only 16% of these 1 billion op specimens actually have digital records. If you wanna know about their DNA, uh, you can't get DNA from too many fossils, but from a lot of the collections made from living species, you might be able to get DNA, but as it turns out, only 0.2% have accessible genomic records out of these 1 billion specimens. So um, we also know there's biases too, right? There's biases for, uh, based on sampling uh, through space, across geography. We know that there's biases in origin. Much of these come from the Southern Hemisphere and there's a legacy of colonialism that's baked into this information. And then also there's other biases of staff. Certain foci over time have changed in terms of how people are collecting and what people are studying. So there's a lot of information here that needs to be triaged and assessed so that we can understand it. And fundamentally, from a digital perspective, I think the most important thing is to make those data visible, useful, and accessible. So we have a variety of tools, some of which that many of those in the audience may know about. Uh, a lot of these names you may be familiar with, and they are all centered on the specimen. Those one billion objects, those don't change, but it's their context, their data that make them really important and useful if we wanna understand the response of biodiversity, of our crops, of our ecosystems to climate change. The climate change that we will see in the future has analogs in the past in the way that we can better understand what that means for the world that we are gonna um, uh, pass on to our descendants. Uh, that kind of question can only be addressed with natural history museums. What is the origin of the next pandemics? Those are the kinds of questions we can answer if we have specimens that are accessible, visible, and useful. And trying to unite all these tools, that's really the, the task that's before us. How can we create a knowledge layer so that these data can be shared and be made most useful, not just to researchers, but also anyone in the public who may wanna know through say, for example, iNaturalist or eBird. Um, there's important contributions that a variety of people can make to this. So, Museum, why we want to do this, just as I end here, 
museums are trusted and trustworthy organizations. I'm adopting some of the parlance from the ODI uh, because I really do think of natural history museums as data institutions. And um, my last, the last reflection I want to have to share with those in the audience centers on right across from the Natural History Museum is this museum on the mall, the Arts and Industries Building. Uh, this is an older building uh, from the 19th century, recently rehabilitated. It's beautiful, um, but not a great space for storing collections. And, and that was always widely understood. And uh, there are, are very few collections in it today as it's been rehabilitated into an exhibit space. But in the 19th century, that was where we kept a lot of these objects. And this is a, a vignette from 1889. A whale was captured, was um, picked up, a whale carcass picked up off the beach nearby, uh, about an hour and a half's drive uh, in the 19th century, that would be a much longer trip, and brought to the footsteps of the Arts and Industries building to be processed, to for the flesh to be removed, for the skeleton to be cleaned and integrated into our collection. This particular whale is a beaked whale, among the more mysterious whales on the planet. We hardly know about these deep diving whales. In particular, this is Gervais beaked whale, beaked whale that sometimes washes up on the shores from Europe to North America. Mesoplodon europaeus is its scientific name. But what I see in this image is not just the whale on the footsteps of the museum, but also all the people who are onlookers, uh, including young kids, including African-Americans, uh, audiences that have been excluded from participating in the activities, what makes museums important. And I think that natural history museums as data institutions should be available to everyone. Those should be open spaces and have open data frameworks. So if we really want to make a contribution, we have to think forward about those children who are coming into the museum today who uh, may not always feel welcome, but should be made to feel like they can participate in the activities of the museum because some of them will be around in 2100 and some of them will see a 22nd century. And so that's who I'm playing for generations to come who still know the value of these collections and what they can tell us about the world they'll inherit. Thank you. And I turn it back to you, Jack, in London. Thank you so much, Nick. Again, just a, a real pleasure to see um, an interpretation of, of data institutions in a context that I don't think we could have imagined when we, when we started this work. Yeah. Um, and also kind of lots of lessons for us as, as, as a data community to learn from institutions like the Smithsonian about the concept of stewardship as well. So uh, thank you again. Mm -hmm.